Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to find the lost tribes of Israel. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Welcome to The God Culture, where we urge you to challenge tradition, as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational, but to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men, which Jesus himself rebuked. Jesus said to the Pharisees, full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition, Mark 7.9. We have proven modern Kurdistan is the location of the lost tribes who stayed in Assyria, and the Philippines is the location of the lost tribes who took the year and a half journey from the Euphrates. But we're not done proving it yet. In this video, we will lay down serious historical evidences that support our position. For context, we point you to our little-known history of the Philippines, Ophir, from Part 6 of Solomon's Gold series. We know many will fight traditional mindsets throughout this series because we have all been trained to believe a certain way. Set that aside. Check out what our research has uncovered and then go out and prove all things for yourself. This is the only way to guard your heart lest you be deceived. This is your mission if you choose to accept it. Let's begin with the land that 2nd Esdras names as the destination of the lost tribes who took the year and a half journey, Arsareth. We will cover the journey in the next videos, but we will find the origin of this name today. We're going to start with the Jewish Encyclopedia. Don't worry if you are skeptical of such references, because we are too. However, we are going to test this to see if it is true or at least has some bearing of truth to it. It may well be lined with the leaven of the Pharisees, and we'll test that as well. Okay, Arsareth, the name of the land behind the great river far away from the habitation of man in which the ten tribes of Israel will dwell, observing the laws of Moses. Of course, It actually says they already do dwell, so let's make that clear. But, okay, until the time of the restoration, according to 4th Esdras 13.45. Note that 2nd Esdras that we are talking about is the same as 4th Esdras in their terms because they're counting Ezra and Nehemiah, the Bible books, as 1 and 2, and then 1st Esdras is 3, 2nd Esdras is 4, just so you know. Columbus identified America with this land, and they cite a Jewish author, which we will review, but did he, did Columbus even know what America was, or did he even believe he landed in America, or did he actually believe that he landed in Ophir and Tarshish and the Garden of Eden? Hmm, sound familiar? Oh, this is good. The name, it has been suggested by Schiller Sizninzi, however you say that, <laughs> is taken from Deuteronomy 29, 24 through 27, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord and went and served other gods, the Lord rooted them out of their land and cast them into another land, Arez Aharet, as this day. Strong's concordance renders Aher Aretz, but the Jewish encyclopedia switches the order, but that's okay. That changes things, but that's a small thing compared to the rest. Note, also, the Jewish encyclopedia is citing the wrong scripture as cast them into another land is actually in verse 28, not verse 27. But that's okay. We all make those kinds of mistakes We do it as well, and sometimes we'll quote a scripture with uh, 13 instead of 33 or something like that. That happens. However, 
Where were they this day, as Deuteronomy tells us? This day of record, because that is used in this passage as a marker as to what another land means. So we'll explore that quickly. Moses tells us where they were when this occurs. Deuteronomy 29. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab. See, that's where they were during that passage. Beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb, which is Mount Sinai. So, simple test. If Yahuwah God is going to cast them into another land, as it is this day, where were they this day in the writing of this scripture. In Moab is where they were. So, does another land mean Moab? No, of course not. The point is, it is not specifying a land, because if it was, it would not say, as it is this day. In other words, it's like saying, as in the strange land of Moab. It's a comparison. It's a generality. Because Moab is not a year and a half journey from the Euphrates, is it? Its use is general, and it is not a name from what we can see. Before we get to that, there's one other thing in the Jewish Encyclopedia article, which really, frankly, bothers us. Why did you wish to sail west? To open a new route to Asia. Asia is the richest kingdom, the land of spices and gold. At the moment, there are only two ways of reaching it. By sea, sailing around the African continent, the journey takes a year, or by land. But the Turks have closed this route to all Christians. There is a third way. By sailing west across the ocean sea. The distance is unknown. It's said to be infinite. Infinite. Superstition. I believe the Indies are no more than 750 leagues west of the Canary Islands. How can you be so certain? The calculations of uh, Toscanelli, Maradotti, Esdras. Esdras is a Jew. So what's worse? Two minutes, and already you're a dead man. For telling the truth? Yes. We are burning people for less. Yes, Columbus was familiar with Arsereth, the location of the lost tribes. And yes, he was going there and thought he landed there, in fact. You'll see. Here's the book from Kaiserling and Meyer that was referenced by the Jewish Encyclopedia. It says about Columbus, he was very fond of reading the Bible and the fourth book of Esdras, we know as Second Esdras, which was probably written by a Jew who lived in Palestine. Well, that's quite a guess. Yeah, Ezra was probably a Jew. Yeah, he certainly was, and certainly lived in Palestine. Right. According to His own assertion, the incentive that impelled him to plan his discoveries was not a love of science, but his interpretation of the prophecies of Isaiah. We cover those, and where do they lead for the location of the lost tribes, which we even mapped out for you, who, according to Esdras, took the year and a half journey? Well, the Philippines, of course. Is that where Columbus was headed? In Portugal, Columbus earnestly conceived the idea of making maritime discoveries by way of the West. He wished to find a new ocean route to the regions of Cathay, which is China, and Sapango, which is Japan, which were reputed to be rich in gold and spices, and also to the realm of the priest King John. Now, that's Prester John, that was a myth and never proven, never any evidence to support that myth that traveled around for several hundred years back in those days. So we're going to set that one aside. We're not even going to vet it because it takes too much time. But 
Esdras and Isaiah are not myth. What did Columbus know? The Stanford Report records, in fact, it was Solomon's supposed wealth that drove Chris, Christopher Columbus toward America, looking for the wellspring of Solomon's gold treasure in the biblical Tarshish and Ophir. Columbus decided to take a shortcut to the east, circumventing all the intractable political problems in the Middle East, if he was to take the other way. It is said that when landing on the shores of modern-day Honduras and Panama, Columbus happened to cross a native who, when asked by a translator where they were, managed to mumble something that sounded like Ophir. Well, actually, it was Fete, Haiti, not Ophir, but that's okay. Let's continue. Soon thereafter, Columbus dispatched a letter to Ferdinand and Isabella, the king of Spain and his queen, to place Solomon's gold at their disposal, wrote Wiseman. And Solomon's gold came from where? Well, Ophir, Sheba, Tarshish, right? Columbus knew this, and that is where he thought he landed, not America. So none of his assertions are talking about America. He never said America is Ophir, ever. His narrative the entire time, as we will prove, even though he was in America, but until his dying day, was that he was in the East Indies, in Ophir, and Tarshish, and even the Garden of Eden. Was he calling America Ophir and the Garden of Eden? No way. And he's even proven wrong in his assertions, especially by the gold. From Smithsonian Magazine, Columbus made four voyages to America during which he explored an astonishing, astonishingly large area of the Caribbean and a part of the northern coast of South America. At every island, the first thing he inquired about was the gold. Why? Taking heart from every trace of it he found, and at Haiti he found enough to convince him that this was Ophir, the East Indies, not America, right? Unfortunately, Española was not Ophir, and it did not have anything like the amount of gold that Columbus thought it did. The pieces that the natives had at first presented him with, were the accumulation of many years. But he didn't know this, just as he never knew he located an already discovered land called America, named after, not the explorer, Amerigo, doesn't make any sense, named after its ancient god, Ameruka, the plumed serpent, which is well recorded throughout the Americas. Look it up. It means George Bush, with his accent, actually may have pronounced it correctly after all. Okay, that's weird. History.com writes, after sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, Italian explorer Christopher Columbus sights a Bahamian island, believing he has reached East Asia. Where? I don't think it says America, does it? No, it doesn't. His expedition went ashore the same day and claimed the land for Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain. Right, Ophir who sponsored his attempt to find a Western Ocean route to China and India. Note, as we say many times, India in history is not just mainland India. It's the East Indies. They're typically included in that connotation. So you cannot break that down to just India. And by the way, neither did Columbus, and you'll see. And the fabled gold and spice islands of Asia fabled? No, they were not false. Fables are false. They are fairy tales. This was no fairy tale because they were proven to exist in the Philippines, especially even by the Spanish when they finally arrived there, but also by the Chinese 
already written at that point, the Indians, the Japanese, and even the Greeks record the massive amount of gold from the special islands in the East Indies, the isles, the mountains of gold, as they call it. We cover that. Now, Columbus met with King John II of Portugal and tried to persuade him to back his enterprise to or of the Indies. See, not mainland India. He was going to the East Indies, which really are the Indies because there really weren't West Indies. That was a totally misappropriation of names, but oh well, we have that now in history and we'll, we'll follow it. As he called his plans, these were his words, not ours. Columbus cited Cuba, which he thought it was mainland China, and in December the expedition landed on Hispaniola, which Columbus thought might be Japan. Well, What's missing from the references? He thought it was Ophir. We're going to hone in on this one because this will turn out to be very critical. From the book, The Jews and the Expansion of Europe to the West, 1450 to 1800. The same verse from Chronicles, moreover, is quoted by Columbus in Apostle to the Historia Rerum along with a long excerpt copied out of Josephus' discussion of Solomon's fleet. These are Columbus's writings and additions to these writings. And its voyages to Ophir. Evidently, Columbus has done considerable research on the location of Ophir and Tarshish. Yep, and actually, he got that part right. In an effort to prove to himself that the two places were one. And the Bible says so as well, doesn't it? We prove that. And that they lay so far to the east, right, all the way to the Philippines, we prove. That a ship sailing westward could reach them. So he thought that he could reach them and that they were far shorter than they were. That part he got wrong. After he had himself made that westward crossing, moreover, Columbus remained focused on King Solomon and Ophir in his thinking about where he had gone and what he had found. See, proof. According to Peter Martyr, Columbus identified the island of Hispaniola with Ophir very early on in this thought process, perhaps at the first moment of discovery. Again, proof. And other evidence attests that the idea stayed with him over the course of his life. See? In an undateable postal, he wrote in his copy of Pliny's Natural History, which we use often, he spoke of the first place he had found in the New World as Fete the origin of the modern name Haiti, or Ophir, or Sepangu, to which I have given the name Spagnolia, a later excerpt. Columbus's ten-year insistence that Hispaniola was really Ophir, or Upaz, remember that from Solomon's Gold series? Upaz. Gold of the Pisan River, we prove that, or Sipangu. So Columbus thought he landed in East Asia, in Ophir and Tarshish, even claiming Solomon's gold at his disposal for the king, for that matter. Did he think he was in America, though? No. He thought he was in East Asia, and everything he wrote, everything he said from there was framed— around that thinking. See, this is talking about his thinking his entire life. Everything he claimed he already knew was in East Asia, not America. And he was never calling America Ophir and Tarshish at all, nor was that even correct, as history proves, even in the sex excerpt, that he was right in identifying the region where Ophir Tarshish, Garden of Eden were before he sailed, which was 
East Asia, in the Indies, in the Philippines, he just got his bearings wrong. But none of this turns America into Ophir, nor Tarshish, because Columbus never claimed that. But that's not all Columbus claimed. Check this out. One explorer took these separate legends and connected the dots. His intention was to sail west from Europe to find the Garden of Eden itself. His name? Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus, first and foremost, was searching for a water trade route to Asia. Uh, but in the back of his mind, as, as he went on these voyages, he also, according to some of his letters and some of his documents, was searching for the Garden of Eden. Columbus believed he could reach Asia by traveling west, but he also knew that Eden was on the border of Asia. On his third voyage in 1498, Columbus made a discovery that to him must have been akin to a miracle. Christopher Columbus claimed to have found the Garden of Eden in Venezuela, in a place called Paria. He saw a set of mountains in the distance and a lush tropical landscape that to him seemed to suggest he had in fact located the Garden of Eden. Columbus was convinced of his success because the land he found matched every description of Eden from the pages of the Bible to medieval legends. He saw the physical signs that to him indicated the Garden of Eden was there. And these signs included the mountain that was partially hidden by clouds, the temperature which was neither too hot nor too cold. When he saw the Orinoco River emptying there into the sea, uh, the mass of water so inspired him that he thought maybe he had discovered the entrance to the Garden of Eden. And in his letters written during that second voyage, he indicated that he regretted not being able to explore it further. In his letters, Columbus speculated that the exotic tropical plants he saw were the forbidden fruit eaten by Adam and Eve. Christopher Columbus is someone who I believe was capable of enormous self-deception. This is a man who seems incredibly stubborn and also someone who is not willing to let the facts interfere with what he thinks is right. Columbus did in fact believe he had found the Garden of Eden until he died. And real quick, here's a map from 1507 reflecting Columbus's finds initially. You can see how mixed up they are as he has China and Greenland connected on the same land. But give the guy a break. No one else had found a route to the Indies at this point through the West either. So he didn't have to be right about everything. He's trying to find things out. But his research was not necessarily wrong. Yet he shows the East Indies off of China because he knew they were there. His research was accurate to at least that point. Then you can see his Ophir, Tarshish, and Columbus actually even knew that was the same region of Upaz, for that matter, where the temple gold originated. He renames it Spagnolia, which is very bothersome. But then he finds what he believes to be the Garden of Eden because he did his research right on at least that point, as it was in the same area as Ophir. And Arsarith is connected to all of this. It's also the same area, according to Columbus, as he also thought he found the lost tribes of Israel. So, as a good Christian, think this through, as a good Christian, he does what any Christian would do, of course. He extends his generous hand and takes every resource he can out of their land, that's called theft, and then enslaves them? Nice. Are you getting this? So, he believed he found Ophir, the ancient land, yet had the audacity to rename it and then enslave its people and steal its resources. Was that his purpose? Well, it's what he did. 
and you'll know them by what? Their fruits. So then he repeats the same action for what he believed to be the Garden of Eden when he made it to South America. And Filipinos, it was no different when Spain made it to Ophir. They did the same thing. The fruits are the same, which means it was his intended purpose and the Jesuits' intended purpose when they came, when Magellan and others came. So we know their fruits. Now, the odd thing is, Christopher Columbus, and we are going to explore this now. We're going to talk about this further later. Christopher Columbus was a Jew who wanted to use the gold of Ophir to rebuild the third temple and bring about his Jewish Messiah, who will be the same guy in Revelation known as the beast, by the way, in the end times. Look it up, compare the two, and you will find that is the case because Messiah already came. But check this out. This, from an unlikely source but well-written, this is from CNN. For too long, scholars have ignored Columbus's grand passion, the quest to liberate Jerusalem from the Muslims. Wow. Recently, a number of Spanish scholars, such as Jose Arugo, Celso Garcia de la Riega, Otero Sanchez, and Nicolas Diaz Perez, have concluded that Columbus was a Murano Jew, whose survival depended upon the suppression of all evidence of his Jewish background in face of the brutal, systematic ethnic cleansing. Very sensible. Columbus, who was known in Spain as Cristobal Colon and did not speak Italian, signed his last will and testament on May 19, 1506 and made five curious and revealing provisions. Two of his wishes, tithe one-tenth of his income to the poor and provide an anonymous dowry for poor girls. That's familiar. These are part of Jewish customs. They are. He also decreed to give money to a Jew who lived at the entrance, at the gate, of the Lisbon Jewish Quarter. On those documents, Columbus used a triangular signature of dots and letters that resembled inscriptions found on gravestones of Jewish cemeteries in Spain. He ordered his heirs to use the signature in perpetuity. According to British historian Cecil Roth's The History of the Muranos, the Jews, the anagram was a cryptic substitute for the Kadesh, a prayer recited in the synagogue by mourners after the death of a close relative. Thus, Columbus's subterfuge allowed his sons to say Kadesh for their crypto-Jewish father when he died. Wow. Finally, Columbus left money to support the crusade he hoped his successors would take up to liberate the Holy Land. Estelle Irizarry, a linguistics professor at Georgetown University, has analyzed the language and syntax of hundreds of handwritten letters, diaries, and documents of Columbus and concluded that the explorer's primary written and spoken language was Castilian Spanish. Irizarry explains that 15th century Castilian Spanish was the Yiddish of Spanish Jewry, known as Ladino. At the top left-hand corner of all, but one of the 13 letters written by Columbus to his son Diego contained the handwritten Hebrew letters bet Hai, meaning Bezeret Hashem with God's help. Notice he uses the name Hashem. We will deal with that one later as well. Observant Jews have for centuries customarily added this blessing to their letters. In Simon Wiesenthal's book, Sales of Hope, he argues that Columbus's voyage was motivated by a desire to find a safe haven for the Jews in light of their expulsion from Spain, which happened the very same day that Columbus set sail. You'll see. 
Likewise, Carol Delaney, a cultural anthropologist at Stanford University, concludes that Columbus was a deeply religious man whose purpose was to sail to Asia to obtain gold in order to finance a crusade to take back Jerusalem and rebuild the Jews' holy temple. Now, who does that in Scripture? Who rebuilds the temple, the third temple? The Antichrist. And that is where he declares himself God. But we'll get to that. In Columbus's day, Jews widely believed that Jerusalem had to be liberated. Oh, and where did that come from? We'll show you Shabbatai Sevi, the false messiah, who we'll cover later. And the temple rebuilt for the messiah to come. We are hearing that mantra, mantra even today, aren't we? And we'll deal with that. This is quite an article, quite revealing and amazing that CNN published this. Scholars point to the date on which Columbus set sail as further evidence on his true motives. He was originally going to sail on August 2nd, 1492, a day that happened to coincide with the Jewish holiday of Tisha B'Av, marking the destruction of the first and second holy temples of Jerusalem ties to his cause, of course. Columbus postponed this original sail date by one day to avoid embarking on the holiday, which would have been considered by Jews to be an unlucky day to set sail. Coincidentally or significantly, the day he set forth was the very day that Jews were, by law, given the choice of converting or leaving Spain or being killed. The same day. Wow. Not a coincidence. Columbus's voyage was not as is commonly believed, funded by the deep pockets of Queen Isabella, but rather by two Jewish conversos and another prominent Jew, Louis D. Santangel and Gabriel Sanchez advanced an interest-free loan of 17,000 ducats. Okay, this is recorded. This is history. This is the truth for once, finally. Thank you, CNN. From their own pockets to help pay for the voyage, as did Don Isaac Abrabano, rabbi and Jewish statesman. Indeed, the first two letters Columbus sent back from his journey were not to Ferdinand and Isabella, but to Santangel and Sanchez, thanking them for their support and telling them what he had found. Why? Because he was about their aim. And then he enslaves the people of Ophir and steals their gold. Ouch. Very telling. And Columbus was not the only explorer hired to find a western route to Ophir. Cabot was commissioned at the rank of Captain General in Spain on March 4, 1525. He was given command of a fleet that was to determine from astronomical observation the precise demarcation of the Treaty of Tordesillas, which defined the area of Spanish and Portuguese monopolies. None of that. None of that scriptural, by the way. Because that's not a part of the Great Commission. Go out and enslave people. Uh, missed that part. Maybe I gotta, better go read it again. He was also to convey settlers to the Malacca Islands in the Pacific to strengthen Spanish claims in the Spice Islands. This voyage was officially noted as an expedition for the discovery of Tarshish, Ophir, Eastern Cathay, which is China, and Sapango, Japan. This expedition consisted of four ships with 250 men and set sail from San Lucar de Baramida on April 3rd, 1526. So, back to Arsarith, the location of the lost tribes in the east, which Columbus was trying to find because he equated, and we showed your references, all of these areas in the same place. 
Ophir, Tarshish. He didn't know about Sheba, but that's okay. He didn't understand how to read that passage, which is obvious. She's the brother of Ophir, from the brother of Ophir. The Garden of Eden and Arsareth, all the very same land. According to Columbus, not just Columbus, we prove this overwhelmingly. Now, what does this mean? Now, based on all the evidence, and we're not done with it yet because this will continue throughout, even throughout the series, but especially throughout the next few videos, we believe it is far more likely to be a reference, Arsareth, a reference to the land of creation. Look at this from Genesis 2.4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now look at this phrase, made the earth. It's two Hebrew words. Asa Eretz. Asareth. The location of the land of creation where Yahuwah God made the earth. The land of the origin of creation. And where is that? We proved fairly indisputably in part 12 of Solomon's Gold series. But here's a taste. The book of Jubilees brings clarity to Genesis in many ways. And we deal with this in great detail. We're not going to make a case for the Book of Jubilees today, but it's something you should really look into because the Pharisee language that is out there to obscure this book is amazing and very easy to blow right through as the smoke that it is, the leaven that it is. But in chapter 3, it says, And on the new moon of the fourth month, Adam and his wife went forth from the Garden of Eden, and they dwelt in the land of Elda in the land of their creation. So Adam and Eve returned to the land of creation where they were created, which we prove is the Philippines, ancient Havila, named for Eve, Hava. Then take another look at Genesis 3, and what does it say? Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground, Adama, we'll talk about that, from whence he was taken. So even the ground is named Adama. See, this is literal. The ground he would till was literally the soil from which he was taken. And notice the name of the ground in Hebrew, named after Adam and Yah, Yahuwah, because that's where Yah made Adam. No, that's not our whole case. You will find the entire case with all the evidences and all of the support which are overwhelming. In part 12 of Solomon's Gold series, take a look and see if we prove it. So, Arsareth is the land of creation where Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth, Adama. Because of its length, we decided to split this video into two videos. We will continue with history in the next video and further support our position, where we will introduce the Sabbath River. Yes, because there is one and we locate it. And wow, does this tie perfectly. And we will explore some of the Filipino customs that relate right back to the narrative of the Lost Tribes, including circumcision and Bayanahan? Oh, yes. So, Columbus was headed to Arsareth, Ophir, Tarshish, and the Garden of Eden, the land of creation, though it was to enslave the Lost Tribes and take their gold. This is knowledge that has been lost, especially as of the late 1800s, like much. But go ahead and click on the next video and watch history unfold and prove the Bible true once again. 
Thank you for watching the Lost Tribe series. Please share this video with others and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell and view our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah God bless.